talk about analytics patterns for your, your digital enterprise. So how would you like your boss to be? Something like this? Like if you didn't do that, you are fired? There were cases like that because if you are not analyzing your data and as a company, or maybe you are maybe a CEO or you may be just a software engineer, and if you are not analyzing and if you really don't know what is happening around you, as both as a company and as an individual, you are going to lose. So even if somebody fire you or not, you are not going to be in the business. So being in the business is very important and doing it nice and very, very nice is even more important. So analytics is the key thing. So we'll all get together and try to make analytics better again. So on this, I'll try to cover the data analytics server, analytics patterns, and the smart analytics solutions that we have. So what is smart analytics? It's all about creating real-time, intelligent, actionable business insight and data products. So that's the very high-level pitch of what data an smart analytics is. And within that, when we take the data analytics server, we have three core functionalities that we are going to focus on. First thing is real-time, as Srinath introduced. The second is in incremental analytics. And then the final part is being intelligent. So as this picture describes, the first part is basically collecting data. So we have a lot of sensors that way we can collect data. In. And then we can process them in real time or we can store them. And we have Siddhi which basically do the real time processing and send alerts to the outside. The stored data, you can either do process it in batch or in incremental manner. And that can be interactively queried. And we also have the capability of getting the data out, building machine learning models, and then using that in the real-time analytics. So we have been recognized by Forrester as the second highest scorer in the ability to execute. So that means we have a lot of capabilities on the real-time side if you want to execute certain capabilities. And we were also the cheapest solution among the ones that we were, that were evaluated. Yeah, <laughs> that was a better way of telling that. And we have lots and lots of connectors, uh, SOAP, HTTP, JMX, so on and so forth. Like we have tons of those. Uh, we have ways of collecting them and we have language bindings to get data in and lots and lots of more. So first thing is we define a table. Like we have a schema that we define and then we send data to that particular schema. So when we define a schema, then we can produce an event with that particular schema. But we don't want to restrict ourselves to a schema like SQL because the, the, the way why people are moving away from SQL is because SQL is schema. It has a schema to work with. So we also allow them, allow the customers to add any arbitrary fields with that schema. So since we have a schema, we are efficient and we can process much faster, but since we also have arbitrary values, so when there are odd things happening, we can still record it and do processing whenever we can. So the real-time processing part, we do it in a streaming manner, not in a batch mode like Spark. So Spark streaming, even though they call it streaming, it's a micro batches. So with that, certain functionalities cannot be achieved. So I'll go into the details. But with Siddhi, we basically do streaming analytics by event by event processing. And we can, we, the whole topology the, that we write, we call them as the execution plan, and it has a SQL-like query language, and each topology runs in isolation, and it has many queries, input and output streams. So we'll look into the patterns that we can do out of it. So the first one is transformation, which is the basic form, like you get the data in, you do some lot of stuff out of that, projection, transformation, and so on and so forth. And second part is temporal analysis. You just want to look at last five minutes, last one hour, last second, whatever the thing, and you want to calculate how much of something has happened. You can group it, aggregate, find the maximum, minimum, so on and so forth. You can basically do analysis on last some number of times. And there is also alerts and thresholds. That is also basic. basic. 
the more complex stuff is like event correlation, correlating two things happening in a, in a time period and understanding the uh, understand, understanding that. And tr understanding trends, whether it's increasing, decreasing, how things have been changing, so on and so forth. And you, we have also the capability of partitioning and executing parallelly and joining multiple streams and of course uh, reading from a database. So these are like very simple, basic, most must have analytics patterns when it comes to real time processing. So I'll just go into a little bit of technical details like understanding Siddhi. So in Siddhi we have to define a stream like we define in MySQL. So we define stream, give a name, an attribute, and its type. And then we write the query, like from this stream, I want to select or do some, some stuff and insert into another stream. So that's what basically we do. And if we take an example, we have a soft drink sales stream where it has region of string, brand of string, quantity, and price. So here what I'm doing is from the soft drink sales stream, I'm going to filter out all the price greater than 10. And within last one hour time window, I'm going to, I'm going to do uh, select the region brand and the average quantity out of that. And the quantity uh, average calculation is grouped by region and brand together. And if the average quantity is greater than 10,000, then I'm going to insert into this higher hourly sale stream. So then I can do further analysis on the results of this. So here, it has all the basic things, like you have temporal aggregations happening within last one hour. Uh, you have thresholds and uh, alerting capabilities, filtering happening here. It's like all of those are like small, small stuff that you need for your analytics to happen. So we are doing last one hour average. average. So that means a streaming average. So every time when an event comes, from that point onwards, we see last one hour. So if it is two hours, like two o'clock, five minutes and 35 seconds, then one hour from that. But if you want to do from, okay, one, one o'clock to two o'clock, two o'clock to three o'clock, something like that in batches, then you can of course use the time batch window where it tumbles on that batch. Similarly for length and length batch, and we have also other kind of uh, similar windows for unique, first unique, so on and so forth. So, so that's the basic part. We'll see a more complex scenario. So this is a famous example that we used to uh, call, like for example, if somebody stole your credit card and want to misuse that. So uh, like a, looking like a genuine user, they might go to a grocery store and try to buy some simple stuff. And if they are successful buying that, then they might go to a shop or a mall and they try to buy more expensive stuff and throw your credit card away. So because they have to do that pretty fast before you block that card. So if, they, if that is a pattern that they want to try it out, so we can basically model that and detect that fraud with few lines of code. So here, so we have a purchase stream that has price and card number and the place where it happened. And from every purchase where the price is less than 10, we call that as A1, and then we call it followed by, that means after some number of events, there's another purchase where the price is greater than 10,000 and the A1's card number and the A2's card number is the same. So that means the same card has been used a second time. And all these happen within one hour, so sorry, one day, then it is a potential fraud. So we can basically collect some information out and send it as potential fraud. So if you want to do correlation and analysis, something like this, then you have to use a CEP engine because streaming batch kind of analysis like Spark can't do this kind of processing. So that's basically like how we do real-time analytics. And we, there is also cases where you want to store the data and then process them. So we have this uh, data persistence layer. We have a data abstraction layer on top of it. So we can store it with Cassandra, RDBMS, HBase, or we can use any other stuff as well. And we have a standard REST API on top of it. So with this, the, the most important reason that we have a data abstraction layer here is it is database agnostic. 
So we can start as a startup company. We might, you can have only few data. So you can start with RDBMS. And then your data grows when your business grows. Like you have a lot of lots and lots of data. Then you can basically migrate into a more NoSQL kind of a storage. But your front-end application and the analytics doesn't need to change because you are changing from one database to another. And we can still work with the common one. So we have, that's the main reason that we have this particular architecture so that you can easily migrate and as you evolve. So if you take that, like how you bring that stored data into real-time analytics, we have this concept of event tables, like event streams that we work on streaming data. We have event table that we work on a stored data. So here I have a card user table. I have the name and the card number. And this, by default, is an in-memory table. Like it just keeps in memory. But if you want to back this up by an RDBMS, you can put an annotation and say, OK, this is RDBMS back table. And if you want a distributed cache like Hazelcast or in-memory grid, then you can put that particular annotation. And based on the database that you're actually implementing, you can basically annotate it so it will work with that particular database. And then we can basically join that. Like for every event that is coming in purchase, it joins with this card user table, and basically it joins all the condition where the card number is equal to the card number. And then you, you can basically enrich the stream and send it out. So if you have the card number and if you want to get the card name or the expiry date or something like that, you can basically use a simple join on that case. So that's all about getting data in real time and try to process like different ways of processing that. But we often find out that just doing real time is not good enough. And just doing batch is also not good enough. So we have to be do something in between. So that is the incremental processing. So it has periodic analytics. And incremental analysis is basically on the newly arrived data, lambda architecture, and real-time incremental analytics. I'll go into the details. So we, as a product, the data analytics server has this capability of scheduling stuff. So you can write a Spark script, and you can schedule that to run periodically. So that's, that means it's going to read the whole data set again and again on a, on a given period and going to try to do some summarization for you. But if the data is coming in a streaming manner, analyzing already analyzed data again and again is going to slow your system down, and it's not productive. So, but for some cases, you have to do that. Like if you want to calculate uh, median values, there's no other way of doing. So you have to calculate all the values again and again. So for that case, you can schedule it and run it either a Spark script or using a CD batch window. But in case where you can do it incrementally, we have extended Spark in, in certain ways so that we can basically read the data in an incremental manner. So there's a tutorial session. We'll try to demonstrate that as well. So when the data come in, we are not going to read the already read data. We only read the new data. We calculate the summarization, and we add it to the results. So you can get the updated results on the incremental data, which is what we used with our most of the analytics product. And then there is a concept of Lambda architecture, where we, when the newly arrived new, new data comes in, it goes to the master data set. Basically, we store it. And there is a way of representing that uh, in, the, in the serving layer. And the same data, we push that into real-time analytics. And when you try to query the data, you can basically get from the batch view and the real-time view and do some processing. So this kind of capability is available with the combination of the batch analytics that we have, uh, incremental, uh, interactive analytics that we have, and the event tables in CD. And this is what we are trying to do more and more with our normal analytics extensions that we have built for all the WSO2 products. Like if you take API Manager Analytics, ESP Analytics, uh, IoT Analytics, and all of them, we tend to see more and more like I, we have to do incremental processing. And it has to be on very low latency and high accuracy. So if you want to true, do that, when data comes in, what we basically do is we do, a, a, like for example, let's say this is seconds. So when the data comes in, I collect one second of data, and then I try to do a reduction of that. And I basically say, OK, this second, the count of this data is 25, and the sum is some number. So I can basically do a reduction of that. And every second we do that, and for, for the minutes, we get only 60 of them. So like every second you get one output, 
So for a minute, we have 60. So then we can basically summarize those 60 and create an, a minute output. And for hours, you have to summarize 60 of the minutes. And for days, you have to summarize 24 of them. So it is less work, and it's fast, and it doesn't consume memory, so on and so forth. And it's, so, so this way, we can process data much faster. And uh, we, we have this capability right now in the product itself, and all the analytics for X, analytics for ESB, and so on and so forth is built in this particular manner. But this is not uh, provided as an out-of-the-box functionality yet. So we'll be making that as a query language itself in the next release. So that's what we are working out. So the uh, data analytics server product in future will be able to process all type of streaming data in an efficient manner. So that's kind of the goal that we are moving towards. And when we come to communication, so we have alerts, dashboards, and interactive queries and APIs to access them. And like receivers, we have lots of uh, publishing endpoints like SOAP, HTTP, Kafka, Thrift, um, RabbitMQ is also there. And with ESB, we can send it to all the social media related items. We can also store the data into a database or an OSQL too. And as Srinath explained, we also have a rich dashboards where we can generate dashboards, generate gadgets, and we have WebSocket and polling capabilities to represent those data. And we can also customize this and have security and so on and so forth, roles assigned to those. And we can also, we also have um, like dashboard and gadget generation wizards as well. And if you want to understand the data more and more, we have to have incremental uh, interactive analytics capability. So that's also provided. So we have a full text search, drill down search, and uh, near real time indexing and retrieval. And with that, we can also do, we can we do all of these with uh, Apache Lucene. So that's incremental, and the final part is being intelligent. So if you want to be intelligent, we have to be able to build and run ML models, machine learning models. That's the first part of it. Then we go further and do streaming machine learning, and anomaly detection, and detect rare activity sequences. So that is one key important thing that we have to look into. And scoring uh, to, un to reduce um, uh, what you call false positives, and real-time re re risk detection is also there. So I'll go into the solutions phase in a while, and then I'll try to explain some of these, how we use the, them in different contexts so you can better understand them. So building machine learning models is all what Srinath has already mentioned, so I'm not going to go into details. So currently, we also have a way of a GUI to build the model. We, in future, we are not going to have the GUI. but. Uh, we can do Spark ML Lib or H2I AI for deep learning algorithms. And we also have PMML support so that we can build and run them in the data analytics server. And if you want to run it in the data analytics server, we can basically just say, okay, ML predict, and this is the model. This is where the model is, and the response type is double. We just put that in, and it gives you the result. So it's way too easy. You can just build the PMML or or a, or a Spark model and basically build that, use that. Or we also have the capability of running R scripts, regression algorithms, Markov chains, and anomaly detection in real time. I'll go into the details later. And we also have an extensive uh, store, like we have geographical processing, NLP, machine learning, time series, math, string expressions, regular expressions, and many, many more. So we have all of them, and now we also have an extension store uh, where you can basically go and download different type of extensions and you can also contribute to them. So we have some customers contributed. Kafka was originally contributed by a customer and then uh, we also have RabbitMQ contributed by a customer and some of those extensions as well. So, uh, so we have uh, lots of them uh, on this particular store and we are keep on adding new stuff to that. And finally, we'll go into the smart analytics solution. So the first... Like these are the core areas that we are looking right now. So banking and finance, fraud detection and, and anti-money laundering, risk management, stock market surveillance, um, e-commerce and digital marketing, fleet management, smart energy analytics, uh, QoS enablement, system and network monitoring, and the healthcare. 
So the first important thing that we have to look is, is fraud, like how we can do the fraud and anti-money laundering. So you can see our, our solution correctly fit into the payment fraud analytics solution and money laundering and the identity fraud. So we have built this a lot with the identity fraud that we were trying to do. So if you take the uh, identity product and there is identity server analytics, like IS analytics, analytics for IS. So that has some of the capabilities of this particular solution. So you can basically find out, okay, abnormal logging behaviors um, and so on and so forth. You can basically understand and analyze through that. And the way to solve this is by not just this solution, all solutions, is just by first we write static rules. Like I know, okay, if, if, if this kind of thing happens, it may be a fraud. So you can just write that. Second thing is fraud scoring. I'll go into the details. Machine learning and then the Markov models. I'll go into the details of explaining each of them. So the false positive and scoring is basically like, okay, if you just buy a diamond ring, it's perfectly fine, okay? You're going to propose someone, you bust both ones, so that's okay. But if you buy 20 diamond rings within 15 minutes at 3 a.m. and shipping to four different global locations, then it may be a fraud. But you may be a diamond dealer that you usually do that. So you have to understand what, what, is, uh, what is actually a fraud and not. So in normal case, we can basically understand this with, for, with the scoring mechanism, like we can g give score for each of those stuff. Okay, having 20, you may, the number of incidents, and then the price of that good, and the time of purchase, and from the time of last purchase, so on and so forth, and you can give some scoring mechanism to that and basically come up with a weighted uh, results that tells you, okay, whether it's a fraud or a not fraud scenario. So that's what the scoring does. So that's one of the features that, uh, that helps us to build the solution and reduce false positives. The second thing is we really don't know like whether it's what type it is. Like we, we can't even program it. So we basically try to do, use classification techniques to understand, okay, which category it fits into. So we usually use machine learning and try to fit into some portion and, and then learn by that. So that's the second part of it. And the third is the case which I, I just was telling you, you may be a diamond dealer. So buying 20 diamond rings and shipping to four different locations may be perfectly legitimate. So that case is basically covered through the Markov chain. Like here you train trying to learn for each of the users their buying behavior. And you may be using a credit card to always buy glossary stuff and suddenly if you are trying to buy some different or other stuff in a, in a short period of time, then it may be a fraud. So you can basically understand how things have been before and Markov chain like you know from, the, from going to E to A there is 0.7 probability, so that's okay. But there may be a case where you want to go to E to E, it's just one, one percent probability. So, it, so if that happens, it may be a fraud. So it's, it's like how things have been happening in a sequence, so you basically get the sequence of events happening, and then we try to see the, uh, the probability of mm, things happening in that particular order. So that's basically the Markov chain is. So we have, inbuilt Markov chain processing capability with Siddhi, so we can basically detect these rare activity sequences. And when we identify a, a particular thing of identify, okay, this may be a potential fraud, then just saying that is not good enough. So you have to give some information to the user so they can basically go and dig deep into that. So that's our interactive analytics capability. So, okay, it may be a potential fraud by this particular card. Then it, it may be alert a dashboard or send an SMS or something like that. Then you go to the you go to the system and see okay this card where else they have used this card. Oh, the, so this card is shipping to this address X. So who else have ship, shipped to this address X? So from that we can basically understand much more about the fraud or whether it's really a fraud. All kind of thing can be basically analyzed and understood. So that's this is like in detail of how you can basically understand and analyze fraud. So that's, it's done here. So similar kind of model can be used on all solutions. And uh, when it comes to banking and finance, 
just doing end of day end of day analysis of risk is not good enough because you can't just wait till all this all, everything is done in the, the midnight to know okay tomorrow is going to be a bad day so so we also try to do interday value uh, uh, to understand the interday value by calculating the market prices and the portfolio changes and we have historical simulation uh, variance covariance metrics and then Monte, Car Monte Carlo simulation. So with these techniques, we have capabilities of um, analyzing your risk on different angles and trying to be proactive on that. And when it comes to uh, stock market, front running, pump and dump, and there are many, many such stuff. And we have built a solution that we can basically understand uh, patterns on each of those and try to detect them and inform you. So most of the anomaly cases happens by you artificially inflate or deflate the stock prices, or else by exploiting prior knowledge and trying to use that, or you know, like pending orders beforehand so that you can basically manipulate with that. So since these are the stuff uh, that fraudsters usually do, so what we basically do is we join with the market, market data with company uh, announcements, and news feeds and so on and so forth, and we try to correlate those fraudulent activities so that we can basically capture those cases far more earlier than there's a bigger damage in the whole system. So for example, if it is a client front running scenario, so per seller, per security, we can basically try to track a purchase for a period of time, few, like for a period of time he's doing a purchase, and you calculate the average buying price. And that followed by a larger sale, or a, a few larger sales, where the average selling price is way too high, and that may be a case where he has some uh, inside information, and he was trying to do a client front running scenario. So these kind of thing can be easily written into a CD query language, and we can basically correlate and understand this. And the other part is, we will move to the second solution, which is basically the e-commerce and digital marketing. So customers buying history and item buying history, current trends in the new products that comes into the market, and with recommendation-based machine learning techniques, we have the capabilities of good doing recommendations. So we have a US-based food company which, has, which supplies foods uh, for restaurants. So they basically try to see, okay, this restaurant usually to buy buy this number of items every week, but suddenly there's a change. So it might ask you, okay, if you have forgotten those stuff or things like that. So we have a solution we have already built for us, for a uh, US-based food um, company. And we also have a capability of doing proximity analytics because we have geographical cap processing capabilities. So if a customer is, is at a particular store wandering around, so, so that the system with iBeacons basically understand where you are, and it, it, it informs the staff to go and help you out if you are like there for about 15 minutes looking at some dresses. Or it can even send you a promotion if you are near the store. Like it basically identifies you iBeacon and it might send you some offers to, to get you into the store. And also in cases, it also gives you alternatives of what are you out here looking at? So okay, there's an alternative right over there. Just go and see whether that matches your style and so on and so forth. So, so all of these are done through proximity marketing and uh, proximity alerts. And, and this is one of our customers uh, who do uh, uh, proximity-based um, scenarios on, on clothing, on cl clothing stores. And basically, like uh, uh, mapping the people where they are and uh, analyzing the heat map also gives you an information, okay, which part of the store they are mostly involved in, at which period of time, so on and so forth. And basically, it helps you to program and arrange and get more profit out of that. Then e-commerce and digital marketing is Experian is one of our clients. So they, they were using uh, WSO2CP in specific to basically push ads. Like whenever you pay, your page loads, the, the ads that comes on the page, you have to bid for that. So that bidding process go through CEP. So we have 20 millisecond latency. 20 millisecond is our cap time. So we have to give, deliver a decision before that, whether you're going to bid, bid, bid for it or not. So you can basically, so that is basically done through 
uh, this uh, data analytics server and CEP. So to improve more clicks, to get more conversions, and effective use of allocated budget, like you might have uh, allocated budget to for a, for a particular ad campaign, and where you, where you want to use that and how you want to use that is all decided through that. And higher click-through ratio and greater uh, return on investment. So all of these can be achieved through uh, ad optimization scenarios. And fleet management, we also did um, a solution for the transport of London using uh, the WSO2 data analytics server capabilities on the latest hackathon they, we had with them. So we also, the, so it was a competition actually. So they wanted everyone to present a solution for uh, La transport of London. So we were the winners on that. So we basically get to know where your fleet is, understand the, uh, try to give best options, understand the fuel consumption, so on and so forth, uh, air quality, and lots of other stuff uh, taken into the picture, and, and to manage their fleets, and, and so on and so forth. So we also have a fleet management dashboard, where we have geofencing capabilities, proximity alerting, and uh, normal dashboarding capabilities to that. And uh, smart energy analytics, we are working with a research, uh, research group from Greece as well, so we have uh, some uh, knowledge on that area. So we basically to analyze, optimize the smart grids, analyze smart energy and predict, uh, predict the, the supply that we need and try to manage and optimize that is, uh, and using smart meters and how they can bid and uh, work with the smart grid is also something that we were working on. And just not the smart, smart grid level, in, in the smallest case, like monitoring a home like smart building analytics and smart home analytics are also possible with the WSO2 data analytics servers. Like Pacific Controls is someone who has used a data analytics server to manage all their equipment. So they have um, lots of like, like lift and so on and so forth. So they want to maintain that on, on different places. So predictive maintenance and everything comes with the smart, uh, smartness of that building. And QoS enablement and network Monitoring is part of the system. So with uh, the CEP and the data analytics server, we can basically understand the load of the system, CPU utilization, network traffic, so on and so forth, and try to scale the system based on that. So Apache Stratos were using, was using WSO to CEP, or basically the DAS to do that. And even when you look at um, uh, the ESB, API Manager, and IS, all, in all of those cases, we try to use uh, the, the data analytics capability to basically to understand uh, the system behavior and to try to monitor the system. And throttling, like if you have used uh, API Manager, the throttling part is totally handled by the uh, Siddhi and real-time capabilities. So uh, you have multiple throttling levels, like API application, resource level, subscription level, and there's a hierarchical throttling uh, definitions as well. So all of those are internally implemented using Siddhi, uh, Siddhi query languages. And with that, so basically, like uh, identity server and API manager are heavily using their data analytics capability when we try to do throttling kind of solutions. And healthcare, so CSI uh, is basically using our healthcare because we have first class support for H, uh, HL7 capabilities. So uh, I mean, we also have uh, uh, support for arbitrary values. So HL7, we need arbitrary value support. So otherwise, we can't analyze and process them. So we have uh, we have those capabilities on that side. So just to wrap up, so what's the key differentiators that we have is is basically the real time part. So if you if you want to do batch analytics, just batch analytics, you want to dump all the data in and just run some stuff periodically, then you can basically use Spark or MySQL on your system, and you're just good with that. But if you want real-time analytics, then you have to come to us, because we can give you the best out of the existing real-time system that, that was there. So rich set of real-time functionalities, and like specifically for sequence and pattern detection, correlation kind of stuff. And, and all the existing um, real-time solution, whether it's Storm or, um, or Samsa or whatever thing that, you, that is there, you have to write code and you have to compile them and use it. So we are the only one who gives you a rich um, SQL-like query language that you can basically build your pipeline with the query language. So it's no coding, compilation. And we also have uh, 
we are also focusing on uh, in incremental processing and there will be more features coming up in the future on how you can easily do streaming incremental processing out of that. And uh, integration to machine learning is also uh, the key focus on, on in, in coming future. And we also have rich set of input and output connectors. You can get, it, get them moved from the store. And being high performance and try to give a low infrastructure cost. Um, cost. Like if you, so we can do the same incremental, with the incremental processing capabilities, we can just process huge uh, big data with just two or three nodes rather than just having a huge fa farm of Spark and uh, Hadoop running uh, to do a simple processing job like this. So there are val valid cases where you really need large data sets and large um, uh, processing capabilities to do that, but for incremental processing scenarios, we really don't need that. So thank you for...